Hello and welcome to Tarim Talks. I'm your host, Bob Ryochi. This time, and for the first time, with a video. Before I introduce my guest, I just wanted to go over some announcements. First of all, our anthology is out and available for purchase now. You can grab this from Barnes & Nobles or visit thetaramnetwork.com to find out where you can purchase your copy. It's excellent. I've been flipping through it in my free time. I highly recommend that you grab it. It has a lot of artists and a lot of friends. So go ahead and grab a copy. Secondly, introduce yourself to the Tarum Network community. Go to Hello Tarum and fill that out. Or if you know a star, you can nominate them on thetaramnetwork.com. Stay acquainted with us on social media and go to thetarmnetwork.com for any kinds of updates on uh, lectures, seminars, courses, or uh, exciting projects that we may be up to. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest, Dr. Eric Schlüssel. Eric, it's great to have you on the podcast. It's excellent to be here. I'm a big fan of what the Tarm Network does. I have to concur that Under the Mulberry Tree is a wonderful anthology. I think it's a great book and uh I'm really delighted to see that in the world. Thank you. So uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself, what you do, uh, who you are broadly, and maybe the most exciting thing that you've done recently. Oh, gosh. Um, exciting. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm an associate professor of history and international affairs at the George Washington University uh, here in D.C. And uh, I am more or less a historian of the Uyghur region, uh, and sometimes parts other parts of China as well. Um, and I've been doing research on the Uyghur region in various forms for 18 years. And during that time, I've done a, a, a lot of research, primarily on things like social history, history of the, the everyday life of, of, of ordinary people. Um, and these days, what am I doing that's exciting? Geez. You know, honestly, I think the most exciting thing is that uh, our university has received an endowment for Uyghur studies for our Uyghur Studies Initiative program. And regardless of what I might be doing with my research right now, I think that this endowment is exciting because it's going to create a permanent home for Uyghur arts and humanities at one of the top universities in the U.S. Uh, and will act as a resource both for the academic community uh, and for the Uyghur community, hopefully. That's fantastic. Uh, congratulations to the team that worked on that and to George Washington University for putting this together. And I'm sure you know, being able to preserve and grow and continue uh, learning about or, or, or creating even Uyghur culture here in the diaspora mm -hmm. will be an amazing thing. So you have something on the table uh, and I want to hear about it. I want to see it. I have my own. I brought it out, uh, but he brought a fancy hard copy. Okay, this is, this is the first ever English language translation of the Tari Hemidi which, you know, as I'm sure many of you at home know, is the history of the Uyghur region written by a person from the Uyghur region uh, concerning the events of the 19th century and beyond. Uh, I mean, it's sort of a, a monument of Uyghur history writing. Its author, Musa Sairami, is sort of considered a, a historian's historian. You know, non-Uyghur scholars also really admire his work. And I thought it was time to go ahead and produce a translation so that the entire world, English-speaking world, can also appreciate the brilliance of this work. That's fantastic. And uh, when when was this published? This came out, uh, I, I want to say July okay. 2023. It's pretty recent. So very recent. Very recent. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's great. It took, uh, yeah, it took nine years. So <laughs> thank you for the congratulations. A yeah, monumental effort. <laughs> it's then. really, yeah. yeah. And but really just a valuable addition. Um, and I've been intending to go through this, but we will on this podcast. Okay. But first, I wanted to ask, what got you interested in learning about Uyghurs and Uyghur history? Well, I mean, okay, so I was a bored kid in a small town back in the day. And uh, when I got the chance to go to college, uh, I wanted to challenge myself. I learned Chinese, I studied linguistics, because I wanted to learn about the great diversity of the world and its languages and its peoples. I, when, you, when you're from a small place in America, sometimes you get really curious about the outside. And where's that? Stafford Springs, Connecticut. No idea. That's okay. Most people don't. Yeah, fair enough. Um, it's home of a motor speedway. It's his main claim to fame these days. Anyway, so uh, but when I was living in China, I started to meet people who were not Chinese, uh, and that included Uyghurs, who this amazing food and this really cool sounding language. And I got really interested in sort of like linguistic diversity in what is now China. 
at this point, I'm about 19 years old. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty naive. But I followed that thread. And I got really interested in sort of, you know, what are these regions that aren't Chinese, but they're in China? What's, how did that happen? How did that, how did that, how did that come about? Eventually, I went to, on to a master's in linguistics at SOAS in London. And I and so as for people who don't know, oh, it's a school of Oriental and African studies. Okay, where I studied linguistics, and um, I was doing a project one day on the phonology of Uyghur. It sounds because Uyghur has really cool speech sounds, like language sounds, compared to other languages. Tell us a little about that. Oh, uh, so for example, um, you know the word chki. Now, in most Turkic languages, like in Turkish, it's but you say ikki. Mm-hmm. But where does that sh sound come from? How do right. you have, yeah, or between. It's spelled icky. Right. Or like, um, foot. It should be put, uh-huh. right? But where the heck does a puff of f come from? I was really curious about that. I was curious about the way that, like, um, atlar becomes atlrim. You, know, you have this reduction of sounds. And, like, no one had really got into this at that point. This is about 2004. So uh, I was curious about that. So anyway, I, I put up a poster asking for like native speakers of Uyghur who might be willing to come and record some speech sounds. And who answers the call but uh, as is Isa Elkin, right? Okay. The refugee leader in London. I didn't know who this guy was at this point. And he not only recorded my silly little word list, he recorded his life story with me. And this, this story the man told that as his, uh, Isa was telling about becoming and self-realization and living in a really politically extremely difficult situation, you know, and escaping to freedom in the West was very, very compelling. I went on to Indiana and I stopped being a linguist. I started being interested in society, anthropology. Why are people the way they are? Why do people discriminate against each other? I looked at policy. How did Chinese language policies, at that time they were implementing the so-called bilingual education policy, which is actually a Chinese language assimilation policy. I got really curious, what is this dynamic about? And by the time I actually got to live in Urumqi, at this point I'd studied Uyghur with Gulnis Nazarova, who teaches at Indiana University, and she's amazing. I got on the ground with all this preparation and all of this knowledge and all these theories I'd read, and I realized I knew nothing. And I looked around myself, and I was like, I don't know what's going on here. And during that year... People kept telling me, well, read the history. Read this book. Look at this monument. Oh, this used to be like this. It's hard to realize that, like, for the people around me, these people I was speaking to, history was the thing. And it it, it illuminated so much of everyday life. And it's something which I thought had been kind of neglected a lot in the West. You know, Western scholars were really interested in Uyghurs as subjects in the moment, subjects of oppression, repression, people fighting back against it. But... I felt that there wasn't sufficient context to explain how we got to this place. And I found it suited me really well. I like, as it turns out, sitting down for six weeks at a time in a quiet room and synthesizing a bunch of information together. That's what a historian does. By the time I got back to America, I I was learning Chakatai language, which I now wrote a textbook for many years later. Um, I ended up at Harvard, where I got really good rigorous historical training. And it just seems to be the thing that I'm actually good at that can make a contribution in some way. So that's, that's why I'm doing this. So yeah, that's, that's how I end up here. That is actually really interesting. So something I wanted to capture uh, and expand a little bit more is you mentioned that uh, for Uyghurs, history is the thing. For a lot of them. I'm not saying for everybody, but for the people I spoke to, certainly. Can you can you expand on that a little bit? You were saying, that you know, see, read this book or, or see this monument or this is the way this used to be. It being the thing. I just want to, I want to know a little yeah. bit more about that. Well, I mean, where does the title Under the Mulberry Tree come from? No idea. A historical novel, Anna Yurt, which, ah, yeah, which whenever it's working on translating, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, all around me, people told me to read is... Read Uyghan Ghanzimin, read Anajur, all these historical novels, which are carriers, really, of a kind of alternative historical narrative. If you read, like, Abdurrahim Utkur's novels, they have footnotes and, like, extensive historical digressions from the main text. Like, something's going on here. There's, like, there's an undercurrent of historical contestation happening here. People were very concerned with this past. And if I ask them a question, 
Often people would say, well, you know, on that hill over there in 1877, the Xiang army under Zhuo Zongtang fired a cannon and they took the city with one shot. There's the landscape around me was also suffused with these points of meaning. These, oh, we call them lieu de mémoire in the in the historical field. These places of memory in the negotiation of memory. Okay. I, just, I thought that was important to attend to. Yeah. And to think about. What to you is is um, maybe one of the most notable or significant lutte de memoirs <laughs> that you've encountered in your time as a historian of oil wars? Oh, geez. That's a really good question because so many things have been destroyed. I think one of them, one that might be a place I never got to see, that's the Hanlak Madrasa in Kashgar. Okay. It's a very, very important madrasa, the Hanlak, very old, centuries old, which have played an important role in the uh, education reform movement in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's this key episode in Uyghur history where the Musabayev brothers and other activists, um, like the uh, Tash Ahunum and his family, all these sort of Uyghur heroes, went about intentionally reforming and modernizing Uyghur education. There was a lot of contestation over that. And I wanted to go see the madrasa where so much of this had happened and where important figures had been trained. But by the time I got there, it was Cash Garden, it was 2009. And I asked an old man in the square, I couldn't find it. So I asked an old man on the square in front of Idka. Um, and he said, you know, they tore it down. The bastards tore it down. And the man started crying. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. I think that's something common for a lot of uh, historical monuments or objects or places yeah. of, um, of Uyghur history. Yeah. And we see that you know, the the use of academics, research, and findings are being turned against Uyghurs, yep. um, especially in the case of you know, Dr. Raila Dawud and, and the shrines. Um, yeah. To ex- expand on this this a little bit, you know, what, over the course of your findings, are there any other surviving Lutte Memoirs? Uh, anything that you personally have seen or something that spoke to you that still stands today, even if it may have been altered in some way or form over the last oh, decade? I mean, the last time I was in the region was 2015. Right. To be fair, it's been quite some time. The place that we're standing then, I mean, the tomb of Mahmoud Kashkari, for example, is okay. important. And I know that Emir uh, Hussein um, Kotl Khajiov, a really important local historian, helped discover or sort of determine the location of that. That was a really interesting place because it was a matter of wandering through this sort of landscape of mazar, this landscape of shrines, towards this one tomb that was especially well-groomed and had clearly been you know, rebuilt and maintained. Um, it struck me because I was nearly alone in that landscape that day, apart from a guy selling painted, like oil paintings of Mahmoud Kashkari. Mm. Let me, a note about Rahila, because she came up. Would you mind grabbing that book for me? Yeah, of course. Yeah, the Uyghur Mazalri. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm mess, messing up your whole scene here. I no, mean, no. this. Speaking of Luda Memoir, so a Luda Memoir, you know, a place of memory can also be textual, right? If it's a place that's far away from you. And I'm just looking here, you can see it at Rai uh, Ladawat's Uyghur Mazalri, Uyghur Shrines. It's a very, very important work of scholarship because what she does here is she's documented oh, dozens, maybe a couple of hundred of these places that are, have been so critical and so central to Uyghur religious practice and historical practice for, for centuries, and many of which have, have now been destroyed. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. And uh, if I'm correct, uh, Lisa Ross, the yeah. photographer who we had on this show, actually documented these, um, these mazars, these living shrines, and has released a photo book, mm-hmm. Living Shrines, of uh, Uyghur China, which I actually have down here as well. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not going to make you get that out. Okay. I'll, I'll, you're going to go for you it? You know what? I'll go for it. Um, there we go. And this is sort of, I guess, an example of yeah. one of them. Yeah. So yeah. I'll put this back here, actually. I might, sure. might as well just start pulling out all the books. But like the, these are the Lu de Memoir. I've said this word, this phrase now more times in 10 minutes than I have in five years. <laughs> <laughs> these are the yeah. essential places of memory for, for Uyghur culture. In so many ways. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but and it's similar in the streets of Urumqi even. You know, you'd walk by, when I lived in Urumqi, you'd walk by the old building that uh, Rabia Qadr 
had built and had run. It was still it was like boarded up, and the authorities didn't want you to see it, but they wouldn't tear it down mm. because they were so afraid of what might happen if they did. Okay. Yeah, there's all these sort of spaces you're not supposed to look at, not supposed to talk about, but there are also significant points of on the landscape for for thinking about community. Yeah, like thinking about your place in time and space, and the and the way that that history, physical or you know ethereal in some way maybe rewritten yeah. or the the very revisionist tendencies of the Chinese government to try to project this anachronistic uh, yeah. current belief or perspective uh, that China was always unified that we always have always been under you know uh, Chinese imperial rule or national rule which brings me back to something important which is your book All right yeah no. uh, so I I'd love for you to Tell us a little bit more about it. You know, um, what exactly the Tarakh uh, Hamidi is. You know, you mentioned it briefly. Who Musa Sairami was, and what what drew you to that? You mentioned, you know, you mentioned it a little earlier, but I'd love for you to expand on it. Sure. So we can describe the Tarakh Hamidi as a combination of different different types of book, different genres. In some ways, it's a Tarikh, it's a chronicle. Straightforwardly, it tells you what happened especially between the years 1864 and 1877, during a 13-year period when East Turkestan cast off Qing rule and fell into this conflict between different Muslim factions. Very important. And Sairami was a participant in that. He was born in 1836 in Sairam, of course, in central, central East Turkestan, just northwest of Kuchar. Hmm. Um, you went to Madrasa there, he's very well educated, probably very well regarded as a young intellectual. I think the implication when he describes himself and what his friends say about him is that he's a massive nerd. Okay. Right? Okay. Like he, he at one point, you know, he says, My friend sat down and told me, Look, Musa, you've read all the histories. You know all this stuff. Why don't you go ahead and, and, and write a history? Um, and he talks about how, of course, historians are esteemed at parties, which is not true. So, but why did he write this then? Okay. So let's go back to his biography. In 1864, when the rebellion broke out in the city of Kuchar, led by local Hojas, Sairami had been a schoolmate of one of the Hoja leaders. And his teacher was also joining the rebellion. So he said, all right, I'd join up. And he went with them. He like managed granaries. He did negotiations with a rebel faction. But he was also captured and forced to walk through the desert. And eventually, when Yaqub Beg came into the region, Sairami was captured by him and enslaved. And he spent wow. several years working as a tax collector in the area of Aksu. Okay. Which gives him an interesting perspective, right? So here's Sairami. Okay, he's writing a chronicle, but he's also writing about things that he's himself experienced. And he starts writing this book in 1901. Now, speaking of Lou de Memoir again, this comes from the same set of theories. About four decades after a conflict happens, people are starting to think, we well, should really write that down. And there's clearly this moment, the way that Sairami talks about it, he talks about how it's been a while and people are forgetting what happened in those days. And so it's my duty to find the best possible anecdotes and compare them and see if I can stitch back together the events mm. of that period. It's one reason we love, professional historians love Sairami, because he'll present multiple versions of the same story sometimes. Yeah. And then tell you which one's actually the most likely one. Then he'll mock the alternative stories for being dumb. Okay. Well, he's, he's so good. He's so picky and acerbic. I really like him. Okay. Um, and that's part of it, too. So he's trying to recover memories of a lost time. And there's a lot of uh, sense of nostalgia and regret. There, there's a moment in the story where Sairami talks about trying to go back to Sairam. And it looks different to him. There's nowhere to go hmm. for him anymore. So he moves on elsewhere. Um. There's need to recover the past also because of confusion. So in 1864, Qing rule is cast off. In 1877, Qing rule came back again. And people like Sairami, who had spent 13 years thinking, you know, Islamic rule is sure to be victorious, start wondering well, what happened? How did everything go so very, very, very wrong? Mm -hmm. now, what Sairami knows is the tools of Central Asian Islamic history writing. He knows all the stories, all the techniques, all the ways of comparing sources. And normally a historian like him would work for a, a king or a prince or a beg or someone. And Sairami, early on, he might have had a patron. But mostly he was doing this as his own project 
at a certain point. Okay. So he's really critiquing people in power, even though he's using traditional history writing to do it. And he's really critiquing the world and its changes from a place of fundamental sympathy with the people who suffer the brunt of every blow mm -hmm. when the world goes to war. Um, so in some ways, also a commentary on politics and society. But then the final thing that makes this thing so very, very interesting, because there's obviously a lot of it that makes it interesting to me, yeah. he has a very long mukaddima, a very long uh, prologue or prolegomenon, where he narrates basically the history of the world first. Mm. And the way he does it is really interesting. He takes much of what Muslims in Central Asia around 1900 would think of as historical truth or the truth of the days of revelation or the, the time of the prophets, and he tweaks it to explain why China is the way it is. So that's interesting. Sarami is very interested in China, the dominator, the colonizer. Right. And he wants to make sense of it. But he has a tool of Islamic history writing to do that, Islamic thought. It's interesting to see him try and work out where does this power, seemingly invincible power over us, belong in the history of the world. And that's how he explains, you know, how his people are continuously ending up under the domination of these infidels. And so how does he explain it? Oui, there's a lot of things. I mean, one is he says that China is basically invincible. Okay. Uh, he demonstrated, he tweaks all the old stories to say that no one's ever conquered China. This is not true, obviously. But he suggests that well, maybe China is sort of invincible and maybe the emperor of China is really the descendant of an ancient emperor. And he, he takes a story which has been circulating for a while, especially among the Hui people, Chinese-speaking Muslims, right. about the embassy of, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to, to the Chinese court. It's the way that the Hui usually tell the story is that the you know, Kasha and all these ambassadors of the Prophet come and they, they contest with the Chinese and the Confucians and they decide that Islam and Confucian is more compatible. In this version of the story, Sarami says, the emperor secretly converts to Islam. Huh. Okay. And so secretly the emperor, the Chinese emperors have forgotten that they once converted. And this suggests that on the one hand, there's a special duty that the emperor of China has to protect his Muslim subjects and let them practice Sharia. Right? Right. And on the other hand, there's a suggestion that maybe he can be awakened to that reality again. And so... Sairami explains the uprisings of 1864 by saying that that ancient covenant has been broken. But he says, you know, for all this time, you know, the Chinese emperors were fundamentally okay with Islam. And then in the 1850s, 1860s, corruption broke out. And then the Muslims had to rise up because the emperor couldn't hear them anymore. They had to bring back Sharia. This is a very, very common way of explaining an uprising, not just in the Islamic tradition, also in the Chinese tradition. Yeah. And to add to that, there's another device he uses from Central Asian history writing. And he says, well, why did China become corrupt? Because of the stars. It's astrology. He says the emperor okay. of China, the Tongzhu emperor, was born under an unlucky star. And that's why in the 1850s, 1860s, the Qing was attacked from all sides and it fell into disunity. And it's only when the Tongzhu emperor dies, or in this case, in the book, fakes his death, mm. that the new emperor, who has a better star in the sky, will be able to restore that justice and protect his Muslim people. Okay. Which is why, under that new emperor, that's when the Qing armies come back in. Because in the meantime, there's one more piece of this. Okay, okay. There's so many things happening in this book. Yakub Beg, who is initially so promising. You know, Yakub Beg is a Hokandi military officer who was sent by the Khanate of Hokan in Central Asia to take advantage of the chaos and establish basically a Hokandi protectorate in East Turkestan. What Yakub Beg did was, he was a very charismatic figure, and he kicked out the Sufi leader, who was supposed to be the real figurehead, took power for himself, mm. and eventually established his own rule. But Sairami says, there's a seed of rage in his heart. And over time, the more powerful he grew, the more wrathful Yaakob Beg became. Mm. Over time, he says Yaakob Beg killed Muslims and more Muslims, especially the Hui. And this leads basically to his poetic downfall, where he suddenly dies 
what we now know as, I think, an aneurysm. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So that's how he puts it all together. I, I apologize to the audience at home. There's a lot going on in this book. But that's, those, are, the comp- those are the components that Sairami brings to explain the world. Yeah. Uh, so you said the Hukandi Khanet? Uh, the Khanet, yeah. Khanet. Where is that? Oh, that's in what present-day Fergana Valley in Uzbekistan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see. Um, and something that you mentioned a few times that I am really curious about, you talked about the, the tools of Central Asian writing, mm. and you talked about the tools of Islamic writing. Mm-hmm. What are those tools, and how do they differ from each other and from you know uh, Chinese writing yeah. or today modern modern day Western writing? I mean, the basic tools, if you're a good historian, are the same. Okay. You compare your sources and you create what we call historical truth. Your best picture of the past as you can construct. In the Central Asian Islamic case, there is an obligation usually at the behest of a royal patron, mm-hmm. a king, an emperor, like uh, Emperor Emperor Babur, for example, actually, okay. right, to produce a chronicle of the royal house mm. that explains why it has the right to rule. And that includes use of astrology, like I said, lucky stars. Right. Uh, it includes uh, the use of ancient history um, and the story of the peopling of the earth after the flood, mm. you know, in Noah's Ark. Right, right. And it also includes, um, something drawing a blank here, Chinggis Khan. The importance of Chinggis being a descendant of Chinggis Khan. Now here's a place where Sairami differs. He uses all of these things. Oh, he also uses the concept of the circle of justice. The circle of justice is an old Islamic concept that basically says that the ruler only has a right to rule if the common people are fed. And then everything else falls into place. I see. Right? That's justice. But Sairami turns all this on his head. Uh, He says, the common people aren't being fed, so they revolt. He says, there are unlucky stars, and sometimes the Chinese emperor has a better star. And so sometimes God places a crown of kingship upon the emperor's head. When you get to Chinggis, there's an old legend that all the Central Asian rulers, uh, Amir Timur, Tamerlane in English, for example, have all subscribed to to say that they have a connection with Chinggis Khan. They say Chinggis Khan's divine because a being of light came in through the smoke hole of his ancestor's yurt and laid with her and produced a line of super beings. And Sairami says this is nonsense. Yeah. 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 Well, you obviously, right? <clears throat> right. <laughs> but everyone before him had accepted that story because they had a royal patron to please and to justify. This guy has gone way off the map. And no longer seems to care about pleasing anybody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, what, what you said about not necessarily pleasing a patron, but you know, recording the royal line and, and the actions of royalty. It sort of reminds me of um, Korean emperors and, oh, and that sure. concept uh, where they had a scribe writing everything they do, who but ultimately was impartial or you know. As much as they could be. The most famous story of that is the emperor who fell off his horse, and then the recorder wrote that he fell off his horse, and then the emperor tried to get him to strike it from the record. So then the scribe wrote that emperor tried to get me to stri- strike this from the record. That's the sort of uh, sort of where it reminds me. Um, yeah, absolutely. But and the Sairami, like most court historians, wouldn't do that in the Central Asian context. Right. Sairami, well, Sairami, there are anecdotes I cannot share on a family podcast in this book that concern what Yaku Beg did that Sairami happily shares yeah. in order to sort of document these kinds of cruelties and ex- thereby explain why Yaku Beg ultimately fell. Interesting. Yeah. That's fine. Um, and he doesn't just critique Yaku Beg. He critiques every power holder he can find. Okay. Under the same framework and sort of explains why you shouldn't let a Sufi lead you. Sufis are bad leaders. Oh. Right? They're bad at war. You know, you shouldn't let a charismatic military man lead you. He's bad at ruling. Okay. You know, et cetera, et cetera. There's something else that's on my mind, but I think I've lost track of what I was about to say, so that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, always, it's always interesting to me that everything comes back to the Mongols in one way or another. Sure does. You know? I think even Emperor Babur himself spoke a lot about that. Being a descendant of... Chinggis Khan and and how the Mughals are, are like the 
the rightful heirs to the Mongol Empire. Mm -hmm. Uh, But something else that you talked about, uh, you mentioned, you didn't say, you know, manuscript. You didn't say tome, but you said story. So you you mentioned that the way he writes this is looking back maybe 40 years uh, beforehand with this tint of maybe nostalgia Mm -hmm. or, or longing the idea that he's lost today in, in the modern day that he is in and is looking back at the time that he was a part of. And so is is it written as this fully historical account or is it written with a narrative, a story, or is there a difference in this? Excellent question. And I've been saying story in part because I don't want to get too into the weeds. There many manuscripts, seven manuscripts, went into making this translation. Okay. So here's how he describes his work. There's a mukaddama, there's a entry, then there are two dastans. In a dastan, the Uyghur context, it's an epic. It's an epic tale. Okay. And then there's uh, an afterword where he describes uh, the, the Al-Tashar, right, the Yetashar, the six cities or the seven cities. And these two dastans, these two epics, tell the story of the same period from two different perspectives. And each chapter, pretty much all the chapters, begins with a very common formula, which is, you know, listen to the stories that the storytellers tell. You know, his stories really come out of an oral culture. And he says, you know, he's gathered stories from the marketplace, right? Not just from manuscripts and things that are written down. And they come from a place where the primary mode of sharing information was listening. You know, it was uh, auditory and oral. And I think that he, he regards his history as a patchwork of these stories forming a greater whole. But okay. I think you asked a really good question. Is there a plot to this? Yes. I think it's one thing that scholars have not always realized before. I think people love this book. Western scholars love this book because if you skim it in the Uyghur, modern Uyghur translation by Enver Baitur or Abdurra Pulat Tekmakani, you can get a lot of facts we mm-hmm. say it has great evidentiary value. That is, you know, it, it, you can get a lot of factual information from it. But there's a plot here. There's a drama going on. Mm-hmm. There's a story about hubris, multiple stories about hubris, I would say, and about the nature of evil and you know, the nature of power. And that, that it's subtle, but it's definitely happening. I, 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 I've now read the original manuscript something like 30 times <laughs> over the past nine years. Okay. And eventually you start to notice that Sairami has different voices for his characters. Habibullah Lahaji, the uh, leader of Khoten in the early period, okay. comes across as really pretentious and wordy, but deeply indecisive. Hmm. Like he says a lot, but he says nothing. <laughs> no, you get characters from these different people and uh, he gives life to them and he, he characterizes them in terms of their relation to their poetic and epic antecedents. He uses metaphor to tell us what kind of person someone is. And he'll foreshadow, especially with Yaqub Beg. And with the Khojas of Kuchar, he'll foreshadow and say, and something's, something's happening here. He'll no, critique a little something in someone's character, and that'll be their downfall in a few chapters. Interesting. There's definitely a story in here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that example you had give, given of uh, Yakub Beg, yeah. of the, the rage in his heart that grew over time, that's, that's one of the examples of a narrative storytelling or narrative tool that he used to get his point across. Absolutely. And... And is that, um, I guess, common it, to weave these myths and and epics and mm. storytelling tools that are not necessarily grounded in, in reality, but was part of, I guess, the reality of their time? Is, was it common to weave it into a narrative in, in historical scripts of, of the day? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he references the Shahnameh many, many times. The Shahnameh, the great Persian Book of Kings, was the story of stories for people in Central Asia in the pre-modern period. And in some ways, it still is. And he'll make reference to all these epics of you know, Rustam and all these people fighting between Iran and Turan, the two great lands in, in the epic. That's all there. And that landscape was very real. <laughs> Actually, there's an anecdote in here where a Sufi leader chastises one of his disciples for reading the Shahnameh too much. Mm. Fun. But, you know, going back to Rahula's work, there are a couple of mazars in the Uyghur region which are dedicated to characters from the Shahnameh. Okay. So in many ways, that epic was taking place 
right in their own home country. And if you read the Shahnameh, the place it talks about, Chotem, it's on the edge of civilization for the writers of you know, the Shahnameh, but here they're reading about places that are actually mentioned in their own homeland. So yeah, the, the stories were very, very much present. And that's how people would make sense of, uh, of, of their narratives and their history. That makes sense. Ever present. Yeah. Let's shift gears a little, oh, yeah, totally. a little. Yeah. Um, I don't want you to give away the entire book. Am I uh, talking too much? No, no. I just think that uh, our listeners should be buying it and reading it because it sounds incredibly compelling. And I'm sure to read it next. Uh, now that I've finished the book that I was reading, the, the name of which I can't remember anymore. That doesn't matter. Um, oh, it was Waiting to be Arrested at Night. Oh, that's an amazing book. That is an honestly, amazing read that book. one first. Talia Hamadiz Gil's prose is outstanding. It's compelling and captivating. Yeah, it's, it's really good. It, you fly through the book, really. And despite it being an incredibly rough series of events he describes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sorry. No, no, no. It, uh, it feels, as you're reading it, almost like... You're watching a frog in in water that's getting warmer and warmer, and you're just wondering when he's going to jump out, you know. And thankfully, he does, and that's why we have the story. But you can just feel the walls closing. It makes you almost claustrophobic. That book. For those of us who lived in in Urumqi as well, a number of us I've I've talked to, you can feel the city around you very vividly mm. in his book. I think it's beautifully described. Beautifully described. But again, like it, I'm so glad that that book is available and it's being translated into so many languages. It's part of the same mission, you know? Uh, in Uyghur studies, if that's a field, translation has been neglected for a really, really long time. Why do you think that is? I think one thing is that since, let's say, the 1980s, American European academics have often seen translation as a colonialist or imperialist exercise that to translate is to do so much violence to the original text and to submit it so much to the desires and assumptions of a Western audience mm. that it's not worth doing. Interesting. But it's also true that universities do not reward you for doing translation. Okay. Yeah, I worked at a university, and this doesn't count for much of anything at all for me, unfortunately, within the university system. So we're discouraged from doing it. Let's publish or die, right? That's kind of the Yeah, the but research. not not publish this. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Publish anything else. Um, so what we've been really been lacking that now that there's such an urgent need to communicate in nuanced ways and evidence grounded ways about the Uyghur region and ways that center Uyghur voices, I think translation is becoming really, really critical to that endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't expect everyone's going to learn Uyghur just to read a historical source. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Is there, um, this is a, a personal curiosity of mine about sure about what you said, translation has been lacking. Is there also maybe a myth or, or a belief rather that Uyghur historians or Uyghur authors of history are not as reliable, um, that you should do the research yourself because you have a more objective eye because you're looking at it from afar as opposed to Uyghur historians or authors who were in it at the time and, and naturally might have a a bias yeah. and rendering their, their research less worthy of reading. There is a myth of the objective, distanced Euro-American researcher who parachutes into a place and sees something no one else can see, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly um, what I'm that's, talking that's about. That's definitely a myth. Uh, it's, it's not a one that I subscribe to. And I think increasingly people are realizing how damaging that myth is. I mean, first of all, just look at contemporary Uyghur historians. Look at Nebitan Tosun and the kind of work that he's done. I mean, he's writing the definitive book, the definitive series of books on Uyghur history in the 20th century. And he is, I think, the world's leading authority on the Second East Turkestan Republic, right? Oh. And not someone writing in English. I mean, there are so many, Shere Pushtar, for example, has done wonderful historical research. He passed away recently. At the age of over a hundred, I mean, there are amazing scholars in the region, but yes, I think that because of that bias on the part of outsiders, attention to their work has suffered. Yeah, yeah, uh, and more broadly, um, maybe relating it to what's happening to Uyghurs, 
or or in oh, yes. this case with the history of the horse, but why has this myth persisted and why is it inaccurate? Because personally, I think it, that's something that I loosely may have ascribed to uh, when maybe five, six years ago or when I was younger, mm-hmm. this idea that, you know, oh, you know, Western academic institutions are, will do a better job because they're distanced. You know, that is probably a result of growing up in the Western ac- academic and educational systems. Uh, but I want to I want to hear from you, a historian who's in these institutions, why that that's not necessarily true. Well, it's not necessarily true. Uh, we do have to remember that Uyghur historians have been working in the Chinese academic system, which is a very unfree academic system. Um, I know I have colleagues who wish that they could work on certain topics, and they never could because it'd be too sensitive or it might run afoul of someone's sensibilities. Uh, one of the reasons I did this was the last time I saw some of my colleagues in 2017, we were at a, a workshop, Rai Ladawit was there, a few other people were there who I won't name for security reasons, mm-hmm. and I, I was the only American. And I said, okay, well, what should I do? You know, I'm becoming more secure. Uh, what do you want me to do? Do I have an assignment? And they're like, yeah, here's some things we work on. Chaga Tai textbook. Teaching an Uyghur history class. I'd started, I'd started this work a bit, and they're like, yeah, go translate the Tarek Yehemedi, because that's a nice nuanced voice hmm. from our past that's worth reading. You know, these were my three main assignments. You did your homework. I, I tried to do my homework, yeah. But it's in part because there were some things, um, and we talked about a common research project that obviously I've tried to honor since then, that you couldn't do in China as an academic. There are things you can't really yeah. write about. So that, that is a bit of a problem. But then here's one of the problems with Chinese academic institutions. Now, the last time I was at, uh, I gave a talk at Xinjiang Normal University in mm-hmm. 20, 2015, I want to say. And I learned while I was there that there was a new policy coming down from the administration that they would no longer teach Uyghur historical sources because they're supposedly not reliable. You know, what's, you know what they thought was reliable? Chronicles written in Beijing ah. by, like, the Qing government. Okay. The, the, the least reliable, most politically biased sources I can think of. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, in the Chinese historiographical tradition uh, are the ones made to please the Chinese emperor. And they also right. are written so far away from East Turkestan, it makes no sense to use those as sources. And do you think that they're, when they say that you can only use those as the most reliable for that yeah. they genuinely think that this is the most reliable form or that they know that this is a version of history that they want to present to the world? Oh, it's both. Yeah, it's so both. Look at the politics of history anywhere, even in America. You have people who are doing this cynically because they want to shut people up. Mm-hmm. And you have people who just believe like, yeah, of course. People in power know exactly what's going on. They're not, they're not interested in telling a biased story. Okay. Of course yeah. we can trust, you know, a... Uh, uh, a pre-modern empire <laughs> to yeah, tell okay. our history for Fair us. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I think it's it's somewhere between cynicism and sincerity. Okay. Right. So why? But you're asking why isn't why isn't it true? Yeah. Why isn't it true? Because it works like this, for example, and this isn't the only one. There are other chronicles from the period which are very very good. Maybe not as good as Sayrami, but Qurban Ali Khalidi's work is a man in Tarbakatai who wrote this massive world history at the dawn of the 20th century, which rivals Sairami, rivals a lot of Western historians. There's great work out there, which was done by people who cared about truth. They cared about crafting a coherent narrative and arguments, but they did so outside of the hegemonic, you know, the dominant traditions of making knowledge about the past. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of people laboring, this certainly used to be, a lot of people laboring in like local history offices in East Turkestan. Interesting. Doing really good oral history work. You know, they'd go out, they'd record stories, they'd look for historical sites, note their location, note the details. They're doing like the, the good spade work that we all rely on. And increasingly, up until 2017, they were doing so in more and more innovative and creative ways in the humanities in East Turkestan universities. Um, I think things got cut off in 2017 just at the moment when they were getting really, really interesting and really world-class. And we talked about Tahir Hamad's book, 
yeah. about how intellectuals had to find creative workarounds and sensors. Do you think that these creative methods of historical exploration or historiography, is that what, yeah, what you call it? Well, yeah. Um, that those were born from these restrictions, knowing that approaching a topic in a certain way would be too politically sensitive, so they come at it from a different angle to get the same uh, content wrapped in a different message. It's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. It's a clever way of working on the state. But I think it also comes from a pre-1949, a pre-Chinese conquest of mm. East Turkestan um, tradition. Because a lot of historians like Sherif Kushtar and writers like Amdurey Mütker, right, mm. who, who write historical novels, they'd begun that work before 1949. And they were trained by sort of Soviet-influenced or Turkist-influenced schools, or they'd been abroad. They, they, in some ways, I really see Uyghur academia as having preserved elements of intellectual life that are specific to the region mm. and that predated and in many ways survived uh, Chinese dominance. Interesting. Yeah, so it's, I think it's both. I think it's both. That's yeah. That um, leads me to another question: is the the differences and similarities? That's a pretty simple question, I guess. Uh, uh, between Western Central Asian studies and the more you know Soviet Union style Turkology or or Central Asian studies of the East versus the West, I mm. guess. So you mean the context means sort of. Western Central Asia, West Turkestan, the post-Soviet region versus East Turkestan? No, no. Oh, okay. uh, although that is an interesting question yeah, as well. Right. But but more so, how does the the approach to Central Asian studies differ in Western institutions versus the the Soviet institutions of the time? Of this time or like which time? I, I suppose um, whatever time you're familiar with, but generally... The, the surviving Soviet institutions okay. probably carried over s those methodologies or, or how it was born, how Ooh. it started? In many ways they have. I mean, okay, so obviously his, the Soviet Union academia was historical materialist. It was strongly Marxist. Mm -hmm. And any history of East Turkestan was written from an explicitly and very formulaically Marxist perspective. Mm -hmm. It was all about the laboring classes, feudalism, the exploiters. This is this stage of history. That's that stage of history. And compartmentalizing people into, into skills of development. But it was also very colonialist and very ethnographic mm. in its way, right? It, it took a lot of the elements of from imperial Russian dominance of Central Asia, of looking at local people as sort of subjects. Um, and over time, the Soviet Union, you know, you have had experts like Professor Ablet Kamalov of Turan University, an amazing Uyghur historian and academic. Um, and actually, Nebajan Tosun himself, who got his PhD in the Soviet Union, just as it was collapsing and finished as PhD in Russia. Um, both brilliant scholars. Good timing. Good timing. But I mean, there ended up being many, many more sort of insider, outsider scholars who came from the region themselves, but who still sort of worked in that paradigm and also similarly found ways of expressing themselves. But Western studies of Central Asia, it's a lot more like Kremlinology. At first, there's a lot of sort of studies from a distance, peering in, looking at newspapers, or like uh, I, I've known scholars who like went to the Uzbek Republic under the Soviet Union, spent a year there, and were only allowed to do three weeks of research. Huh. So you spend a lot of time hanging around to get that little nugget, that little uh, bit of info you can steal and take back to mm. your institution in the West, and uh, you know produce knowledge with it. Um, so there's very different modes of seeking knowledge. Yeah. Mean, after the fall of the Soviet Union, things have changed, obviously. Um, and in many ways, you know, the real heart of Uyghur studies is still in Central Asia. You know, because that's where you find Uyghur scholars who have a relative degree of academic freedom yeah. to produce really rich work, you know. Um, and the West, the West, I mean, the West is not one place. I'll talk about America and Canada. Um, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the, there's a huge surge of nationalism studies because, for some reason, people thought nationalism was dead, that it wasn't going to come back. And then when the communist bloc countries fell, all of a sudden, there were all these nationalist movements, including in Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, etc. Right. 
And that also carries over into the Uyghur region, right? This one reason why so much of the scholarship on Uyghurs in the 90s is about identity. Yeah. Where does ethnic identity come from? What is national identity? What are these mm. variations? I think we've kind of moved past that now. And as genuine collaborations between Central Asian scholars and Euro-American uh, colleagues has increased, what we're seeing now is a lot more deep social history. And uh, at least in West Turkestan, formerly Soviet Central Asia, mm -hmm. You know, a lot more social science work being driven by scholars who are from the region. And they might have studied in you know, the UK or America, but now they're leading institutions in places like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of different things going on in that sense. And uh, Central Asian studies is a small enough field that we're all kind of swimming through and finding our way. But my last point on this is going to be that I think East Turkestani studies, Uyghur studies, is considered one of the most innovative and forward fields right now uh, within all the Central Asian studies. It's most productive. Um, I don't entirely know why that is. Maybe because the food's better? Y you think I'm joking, but if you go to Indiana University, is the center of studying Central Asian languages. Sure. Sorry, Malakaka and everybody, but Gulnisa Nazarovas Polo is the best. And you learn that quickly. I think there's an attraction to Uyghur culture. There's a soft power if you will, with Uyghur culture. Okay. Uh, that if you encounter it, you're really curious about it. So I think we care, and I think the, the crisis has also spurred a new generation of people who think very differently to make innovative efforts, mm -hmm. to expand accessibility to the field and materials related to it, Yeah. Uh, and to produce sort of really new work that challenges our, our existing paradigms. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to I want to shift gears again. Yes, yeah, please shift gears because I'm getting all lost. So we talked about how you got into yeah. Uyghur history. Now let's say for our audience, someone else wanted to follow your footsteps. Yeah, what would you recommend to them? Depends where you're starting from. Uh, this is a small enough field at the moment that people find many different ways into it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a native speaker of Uyghur, you have a massive advantage already. Because here's the secret, the Chakatai language, the pre-modern lingua franca, common language of Central Asia, is a lot like modern Uyghur. <laughs> so one thing you might consider doing is just pick up some history books and think about what you find interesting, what questions you find make you curious. Um, one thing I think is really important is language study. Um, Uyghur sources are really important, but maybe you need Persian. You probably need Chinese. You likely need to learn a bit of Russian. Um, and starting language preparation early is really, really helpful and really important. Um, apart from that, look for... People find all different ways into this. Um, look for a degree program with a scholar who you can work with, whose work speaks to you. Hmm. It doesn't have to be an Uyghur specialist, but let's say someone who works in Uzbekistan. Okay. Like let's say it's Marianne Camp at Indiana University, amazing scholar of uh, women's history in Uzbekistan, right? Brilliant social historian. If you're interested in women's history in the Uyghur region, she might be a great person to learn from because you learn comparative cases and get to think sort of beyond your, your present space. Right. Right. Um, the other thing to do one other way of doing it. But you see, some people lead with a question, some people lead with a source. Historians, we come at it from both directions. Like sometimes we, we start with a, the big burning question. But mine was sort of, how do people of different cultural backgrounds learn to interact with each other? Okay. Right? That was my question, I think, from when I was a kid. Some people begin with a source, a really compelling narrative. For example? For, yeah, for example, Tariq Hamidi, for yeah. example. You know, the way you're saying in here is really piques your interest. Or you can like learn to read a bit of Chakatai or pick up David Brophy's translation of the Tezkiri Azizan. There are a bunch of things in translation now. Mm -hmm. Learn some Chakatai, find one of the many digitized manuscripts from East Turkestan online or the newspapers. We have all these newspapers like Sherki Turkestan Hayati from the 30s and 40s online. Start reading. Do you enjoy reading a newspaper? Do you enjoy sitting down for four or five hours and just like pouring through a text and taking notes? Then maybe this path is for you. It'll be fun for you. Maybe reading the text will spark questions 
Maybe the questions will be about, you know, the events described in the text. Maybe they'll be about the apparatus that produced the text. Maybe they'll be about, you know, even the, the mode of printing it or the mode of writing it. Hmm. You never know what's going to spark you off. Um, I guess in summary, what I'd say is dive in and see if you like it. Yeah, I think that's good advice for almost everything. I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning is practically meaningless in this, <laughs> in this context. <laughs> no, I think, I think that the way that you explain that it starts with a question or a source, yeah. that's particularly helpful. You, know, yeah, that actually, you can cut the rest, yeah. That actually made me start thinking, you know, the questions that I have or, or the, the books that I read and what insights they give me or what I tend to think about when I read something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So even now you're sparking questions about it. I'll say professionally speaking, um, the normal path, come from a, a bachelor's degree in whatever topic, whatever it is. Typically, someone in this field has a, a master's degree. And the master's degree is where you really pick up more of your language study. Yeah. And then you apply for a PhD. And the PhD is where you learn more of the theory, more of the methodology. Mm-hmm. Right? And as much as possible, try to get funding for yourself. You know, for, there is funding in the U.S. and many institutions for learning Uyghur language. And that will help you pay for your education. Or learning other languages that might be useful to your project. So look around for those opportunities. This isn't supposed to cost you money. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. I guess. Um, switching topics one more time. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot. That's okay. I don't mind a lot. Um, Clearly, I don't mind a lot. I've been gabbing endlessly. No, this is fantastic. Uh, I love a guest who knows to just dive right into a topic and, and talk about their passions and interests. You're a very good interviewer. That's, that's what I, I like to do. I, I ask the questions that I'm interested in hearing an answer about. And I, just asking questions. Huh? Yeah, I'm just asking yeah. questions. Um, so another thing, you know, a little more serious, sure. uh, and you as an academic have talked about this before, and with the recent announcement, uh, or, or finding rather, that Dr. Rahila Dawit had been sentenced to life, with the last weekend being the ninth anniversary of the sentencing of Ilham Tohti, yeah. I just wanted to give you some space, some airtime to talk about this. Too many people I know have been imprisoned. And they never deserved it. No one deserved this. No one deserved to be separated from their families. No one deserved to see the trajectory of their life suddenly come to a halt. No one has deserved so many, I'll just speak of scholars for a moment, so many scholars in the Uyghur community had been funded and supported by the state for a very long time, and they were following all the rules. They were doing it just the way that they're supposed to. Yeah. Now, Ilham Tohti wouldn't have heard a fly. The idea that someone like Ilham Tohti or Rahila Dawud is somehow a political danger is absurd. And I know of many other names, too, who didn't deserve this fate in any way, shape, or form. It is cruel, it is heartless, it is absurd. And I, I never used to use the word evil to describe these things, but there's a cruelty and an arbitrariness and a willfulness to this and a dehumanization that I think leads me to characterize what is happening in the Uyghur homeland right now as a deeply, deeply evil enterprise. Knowing, I mean, we'd heard rumors about the Rahila's fate for several years. Having it confirmed was just another blow um, to all of us in the community and all of us who knew her as a colleague. Um, it makes me feel very, very hopeless. But then I remember what Rahila said last time I saw her. And I, I told the story a bunch of times because I guess it's my, my piece, my one little glimmer of hope. And I call it hope. It's cold comfort. Rahila said when I last saw her, things are happening in China now that feel like the Cultural Revolution. It appeared in the 60s and 70s when Mao ordered the destruction of society from below. And people were rounded up and accused of thought crimes and, and sent to camps. She said, something is happening like the Cultural Revolution. But the Cultural Revolution ended. And this will end as well. Now, I, so much harm has been done. So much deep, 
lasting harm has been done. I, I, I cannot believe that anyone in the Chinese state seriously believes that this is a method of winning hearts and minds and creating obedient people in the Uyghur region. I, I think that there are people involved in this who just deeply enjoy being cruel. And I don't think that people will recover from it. But I do hold out hope that things in China come and go, even when they seem incredibly permanent. Campaigns come and go, and I think that this one will end. I wish I knew when, but I think it will end. I think we all feel like you in this. Um, yeah, and it's horrible, horrifying, yeah. and just a just terrible, and another blow to Uyghurs. I wish I had a better way to transition from this topic. No, won't you give you um, another glimmer of hope? Sure, let's I mean, like, Look, I'll say it's a Tarim network. And I, this, I've, I've, I always boost this organization because I think the things that Uyghur youth are doing, that Uyghur youth are doing the diaspora to lift each other up, things like mental health care movements, things like establishing spaces to speak freely and be who you are and to be accepted within the great diversity of this community, things like art anthologies and that, that film exhibition in Kazakhstan, the Kazakh government for some reason shut down because I guess they're afraid of films. But efforts like these give me genuine hope because what I've seen in the diaspora is a fluorescence of art and literature and a revival and even an expansion of the intellectual culture that once flourished in places like Urumqi and Kashgar and Yaka and Khutan and Kucha and Khucha and Turpan. Kumultu. You know, I, that's, that's where I take hope because I think the things that you're doing and people like you are doing are, are actually deeply inspiring. And that's, that's what I think we need to focus on supporting. Thank you, Eric, yeah. for those kind words. Um, that kind of praise is specifically why I came back as a podcast host. So I'm glad it happened on episode one. Yeah. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, with, for speaking with me, for speaking with us, for agreeing to be on here and for sharing the honestly just like fascinating, amazing stories that you've come across as you were reading this, your personal stories and your very heartfelt, you know, message about what's happening today to oil wars and your your anecdote with uh, Dr. Rahila Dawood. I wanted to ask, um, are there any projects that you want to plug? Uh, any upcoming projects that you're excited about and are willing to share? Well, I'll say that Mulan Musa Sayrami, you, you asked, is he a good historian? There are two books that are deeply influenced by Mulan Musa Sayrami. One is Hodong Kim's book, Holy War in China, where Sayrami is a major source, and one is mine, Land of Strangers. So I just want to say the spirit of Sayrami is strongly alive in both of those works. You know, this is a project I'm pretty proud of. Uh, what am I doing these days? It's I'm trying to do the thing that my Uyghur colleagues and I decided we'd do, try to do together. And then everyone has disappeared a few months later. And that is, I'm working on the grassroots history of economy in the Uyghur homeland. Hmm. I'm asking basically how did poverty get this severe? How different waves of domination by outside forces immiserates the farmers and the craftspeople of the Uyghur region over the past century and a half. Uh, it's hard to say you're excited about a project like that. But I think this is going to be, I hope, another contribution that will really nuance our understanding of the Uyghur region's history hmm. and help to explain how we got here. Yeah. Um, and you've shared a little bit about this project with me before, mm -hmm. and I thought it was just fascinating to, to hear about you know, the, the material economy of East Turkestan before this, you know, before modern Uyghur yes. history. Uh, if people wanted to purchase the Tarakhi Himidi in English or yes. Land of Strangers, where would they go? Uh, Columbia University Press has a website. And you use the offer code 
C-U-P-20 will flash up on the screen. You can use the offer code C-U-P-20 for a 20% discount on the book. Great. And if um, people wanted to reach you, are you okay with that? And how would oh, they yeah, do yeah. so? Uh, by email. It's my impossible to spell last name at gwu.edu. So that's uh, S-C-H-L-U-E-S-S-E-L at gwu.edu. Fantastic. Um, any last words or anything that you want to share? I just want to thank you for having me in. And I want to wish you luck with the new uh, video-enabled version of the Tarim Talks podcast. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank, thank you, you for agreeing to be on. And Pleasure. thank you, listeners and viewers. Um, if you like this, if you're watching it on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe. If you're listening to this on some podcast app, make sure that you're following. If you liked it, uh, leave a like or a rating. Tell your friends about it. Uh, share it if you can. And make sure that you subscribe or follow the Tarim Network on Instagram or Facebook or uh, go to thetaramnetwork.com to stay up to date with us on everything that we do. Thank you very much. See you next time.